We have all the time in the world. Time enough for life. Mauritius welcomes you, everybody welcomes you. Your visit will be very enthusiastic. Mauritius welcomes you, everybody welcomes you. You will have a very pleasant holiday. For many years, I've wanted to make a film about my homeland. In 1992, I had the good fortune of being able to return home and visit those relatives and friends who live there. Like a perfect tourist, I took a video camera with me. This is the result. Some call it paradise. Others, the pearl of the Indian Ocean. But for the people who live there, it's home. Two thousand five hundred kilometers off the east coast of Africa, in the heart of the Indian Ocean, encircled by coral reefs and emerald waters, fringed with silvery white beaches, only sixty five kilometers long, forty eight kilometers wide, small but beautiful. This is Mauritius. <laughs> You will see Libya enchanted in Sega dance on lovely beaches and their shadow of pillow. Will you drink bang in gajak tang and sosta crab? Many things else my pen enable to describe. Oh, my dear friend, I'm writing you, inviting you in my island in the sun. Oh, my dear friend, take an airplane. So, so you will taste my Mauritian sugar cane. Mauritius welcomes you, everybody welcomes you. Your visit will be very enthusiastic. Mauritius welcomes you, everybody welcomes you. You will have a very pleasant holiday. Mauritius welcomes you, everybody welcomes you. Your visit will be very enthusiastic. Mauritius welcomes you, everybody welcomes you. You will have a very pleasant holiday. Mauritius welcomes you, everybody welcomes you. Your visit will be very... For a delightful tropical island, Mauritius took a remarkably long time before it was discovered. In the Middle Ages, Arab sailors named it Dina Robin. But it was much later that Europeans arrived here. The Indian Ocean was a vast and dangerous territory for early navigators and traders who bravely crossed it to get valuable spices from the Far East. Only rarely did sailors find Mauritius. It was such a tiny speck in the Indian Ocean. First sightings being made by the Portuguese in the early 16th century. But it was the Dutch who came to settle on this small uninhabited island and named it in honor of Prince Maurice of Nassau. For the next 60 years, they fought many battles against the French and the British. But it was the French who eventually forced them to withdraw. Mauritius then became the Ile de France. In 1810, the island was finally conquered by the British. The name reverted to Mauritius. The British stayed on only to prevent its becoming a French naval base in the future. If early settlers were slow to arrive and realize its potential, today's inhabitants have more than made up for it. Mauritius has a population of just over a million and enjoys a relatively stable economy. Paul Louis, the capital, is the nerve center of the island and a hive of activity from early morning till late. Mauritius is no longer under British rule. 
having been granted its independence in 1968. And finally, in 1992, the year of my visit, Mauritius looked bravely to the future on its own and became a republic. It remains a member of the Commonwealth. solemnly affirm that I will execute the office of president and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution and the law, and that I will devote myself to the service and well-being of the people of Mauritius. Much of the work done on the island is attributed to the French governor, Marais de la Bourdonnais. His arrival in 1735 did much to change the fortunes of the island and make it the star and key of the Indian Ocean. He developed the harbour of Paul Louis as a commercial port and a strategic naval base. The town flourished with some fine buildings, a social life and the air of a capital in the making. His brother built the first sugar factory at Vilbag. The island prospered under his administration. Many of the towns have French names. The French colonial houses still stand as a constant reminder of the French presence on the island. When the British took over, it made little difference. The Treaty of 1815 stated that the French would retain their language, their laws, religion, and customs. To a large extent, it hasn't changed. Although English is now the official language, French is still widely spoken, as well as Creole, which seems to attract French tourists. The French are very much at home here. <laughs> As we conclude this important French chapter of the history of Mauritius, we turn to the French author Bernardin de Saint-Pierre. More than two centuries ago, the saint Géran was shipwrecked on the reefs of Ile d'Ambre. It inspired the author to write vividly about life 
on the Ile de France. The French colonial houses formed the backdrop for the tragedy of Paul et Virginie. Ce bateau qui part aujourd'hui pour les anciennes colonies doit faire une escale au pays où naquirent Paul et Virginie. J'aimerais partir à son bord avec toi changer de décor voir si la mer se fâche encore retrouver ses rivages d'or reprendre les anciens chemins qui montent vers les tamarins revivre ce roman d'amour quand Paul attendait son retour With such a mixed bag of colonizers, Mauritius had a head start towards becoming a racial melting pot. Nowhere else but in the capital is the popery more evident. Mauritians are a living kaleidoscope of shades and colors, inherited from their historical ancestors. These originate from Africa, China, Europe, India, and Madagascar. Visitors are often baffled by the many different cultures, languages, and religions. These appearances are deceptive because generations of shared history have created strong bonds and close affinities between the Mauritians, irrespective of their origins. Hindus are in the majority, seen here celebrating Diwali, the festival of light. Then there are Muslims and Chinese. The so-called general population consists of Creoles, Franco-Mauritians, and others of European descent, which is where I fit in. This photograph of my late mother with the names of her five children is found in the Simioti family tree, Simioti being my mother's maiden name. It was compiled in book form in 1991 by Jean-Claude Simioti and his family, who now live in Australia. Their extensive research was derived from the study of the Simioti genealogy undertaken earlier by Richard Angel Simioti, born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. It reveals that my ancestry from my mother's side originates from Venice in the northern part of Italy. It dates back to the 16th century. They were rich people and eminent citizens. Sadly, we have yet to find such information from my father's side. Who knows what surprises there are in store? The origin of a name like Iraman is anybody's guess. My dad never let on an awful lot on this subject. Perhaps one day the genealogy of the Hiramans will also be revealed. The religious harmony which exists on the island is an example to the rest of the world. Here Hindus, Muslims, Chinese, Tamils and Christians have their respective places of worship almost next to each other. Cool. 
The Christians are principally Roman Catholic. Your visit to Mauritius will invariably coincide with one of the many religious festivals, such as Kavadi, celebrated by the Tamils in the month of January. We've established that the Dutch were the first settlers and that they gave the island its name. They also introduced sugar and are said to be responsible for the disappearance of the dodo. This large, flightless bird was immortalized by Lewis Carroll in Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. The dodo once lived on Mauritius, but when the Dutch left, it was nowhere to be found. The fact that it has become extinct remains shrouded in mystery. Several factors contributed to its disappearance. The arrival of the first settlers was bad news for the dodo. Not only was it eaten, but as man began to colonize the island, its beautiful virgin forests began to change. Before, the dodo had lived free from predators, so free of danger that it nested openly on the ground, laying only one large egg a year. With the arrival of domestic animals, however, all this changed. The dodos were pested and their eggs eaten. All sorts of foreign trees and plants were introduced. But the worst was yet to come. Its natural habitat made way for huge sugar plantations, like the ones which are still here today. Nowadays, these plantations stretch right across Mauritius, where there once grew wonderful native trees. All of this was catastrophic for the dodo. Nobody knows exactly when it disappeared. It just fizzled out into the smoke of time. Many native species of birds have fallen victim to the first settlers, but some were not destined to go the way of the dodo. In 1973, a young Welsh ornithologist by the name of Carl Jones came to Mauritius sponsored by the World Wildlife Fund and working hand in hand with the Mauritius government. At the time of his arrival, the Mauritius kestrel was generally known as the rarest bird of prey in the world. The Mauritius pink pigeon was on the brink of extinction. As for the Mauritius parakeet, there were so few in the wild that they would have disappeared by the end of the century. Carl believed that the only way to reverse the decline was to breed these birds in captivity.
20 years later, Carl's dedication can only be described as a conservation success story. There are many places in Mauritius where you can see living proof of Carl's achievements. At the dawning of this revolution in modern conservation awareness, what greater sight can there be than a Mauritius Kestrel in all its splendor? From the wonderful world of birds, we turn to some tranquil sights and sounds of Mauritius. The words of this gentle lullaby emphasize the importance of work. <laughs> 